Well, I thought I'd talk to you today about managing feedbacks for resilience. So resilience is taking off all around the world. It's becoming the, the, the in thing for policy and management. And uh, it's not surprising because the logic is appealing and uh, times when there are so many failures in social ecological systems. But the question uh, that's puzzling a lot of people and that they're trying to face is how do you put these ideas and concepts into practice? And I thought I would talk to you a little bit about that. Because the thing about social ecological systems is that they are systems and uh, they're self-organizing systems governed by feedbacks. In fact, we define resilience as the capacity or the ability to absorb disturbance and to retain the same structure, function and feedbacks. And uh, so I think the first thing I need to do is focus for a little bit about what we mean by feedbacks. So if we say that in some system, if, you, if A is changed and made a little bit smaller and it leads to an increase in B, that's a direct effect where A affects B. There's no feedback involved. Okay, and if B, that change in B, causes a change in C, that's a secondary effect. But there's still no feedback involved. But if A causes a change in B, and then B feeds back to cause maybe a different change in A, that is a feedback. And that's a direct feedback, and probably quite easy to understand. But if A affects B, and it affects C, and then C affects D, but it also affects E, and E affects G, and D affects H and G, and these go up and down in different ways. And if G feeds back to affect A, and let's say D feeds back to affect B, that's a feedback loop. It's a system of feedbacks. And that's what resilience management is all about. And the reason it's all about that is that the Resilience Alliance is putting together a database of thresholds, which is the shift from one regime of a system into another, where there's a, a marked change between the way a system functions in one way to the way it functions in a different way. And wherever we've been able to get enough data on these thresholds, which are published and known, each time the threshold is associated with a change in a feedback, in a critical feedback. Let me give you one example of, of that. If you, it's a, an old one that, that people know about. It's in uh, desertification, the example of desertification. So what happens there is you go from a grassy rangeland to a desertified state with nothing in it. Well, the system consists of livestock and grass. That's the core part of it, okay? So livestock have a negative effect on grass, and of course grass has a positive effect on livestock. It makes them grow. But the rest of the system is that grass is also affected by water in the soil, by soil water. And soil water is affected by rainfall. But the rainfall goes partly into soil water and partly into runoff. So it runs off and out of the system. And the difference between here is the how much infiltration occurs. So this is, of the rain, some of it infiltrates to become soil water and some runs off. Now the critical thing that wasn't realized for some time is that the amount of grass feeds back to affect the amount of infiltration. So the more grass the more of the rain goes into the soil to create grass. And below some critical level of infiltration, more water runs off than goes in, and there's not enough water to grow grass, and the system just gets progressively drier and it turns into a desertified state. So when you're managing for that, you have to break that, you have to manage that feedback. And one way is to wait until you do have wet periods to take all the livestock off, to put little contour banks on the soil so that it dams the water as it's running. And once you get above that critical threshold again, then the system self-organizes upwards into 
the healthy rangeland state. So this is what we mean by a critical feedback. And trying to identify critical feedback is really the nub of a lot of ecology and into the, the, the whole topic of resilience. Okay, so <coughs> now when we, when we look at systems of feedbacks, can we envisage your system that you're interested in, your social ecological system, as a system of interacting feedbacks? Because that's the way to try and get at an understanding of resilience. And in fact, there's a group of, of six uh, researchers here at the Stockholm Resilience Center that have just published a paper where they have looked and discovered six different marine systems that are in degraded states and that are kept there by feedback processes. And they're suggesting that they've been able to identify what the feedbacks are and then how you might weaken or remove those feedbacks so that you can get out of the degraded state and back into a positive state. And that brings me then to how would we go about putting this into some kind of an approach that, that might be a useful way to, to deal with, with, uh, with resilience management. And I think it says that what we need to do is to ask ourselves How could we define different classes of feedbacks that we need to examine? Firstly, missing feedbacks. Which feedbacks should be there, but in fact are not in the system? And a classic example of those all have to do with market failure. So, for example, you pollute a river in making some product, but there's no cost of that pollution that feeds back to the cost of the product. It's exactly the same thing with climate change. We put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The carbon tax is a classic example of putting in a feedback that was missing. Now, to get the strength of that feedback right is what the current political debate is all about. But at least people are, have recognized the feedback needs to be there and are trying to put it in. That's an obvious one, but there's a lot of others that we need to think about in social ecological systems. And the second category, of course, would be, um, I'll just call them existing feedbacks. They're there, but some of them are not recognized. Some of them are just ignored because they're too costly and people don't want to know about them. And some of them are simply unknown, and we have to discover and try and find them. So I would suggest that if we could examine our systems and say, using these two broad categories, to avoid the system moving into an undesired state, which missing feedbacks should we put in, and how could we identify them? Or, if you're in an undesired one, what missing feedback would get you out of it? And the second category are of the existing feedbacks. Which ones do we need to weaken or break or remove? And how could we deal with those? And how would you understand them? And I'll finish just by saying that our experience so far shows that, that in social ecological systems, the difficult feedbacks and the ones that are often not recognized and just not understood are those that first of all occur across scales. So you, your interest is at some particular focal scale. It might be a catchment, it might be a farm, it might be a natural park, national park or whatever. But that's embedded in bigger scales and there are parts of it that are embedded in it. And it's the cross-scale feedbacks that people forget about or don't take into account. And the second category of feedbacks that, that people somehow don't take into account are those between the social and the ecological parts of the system. People often see themselves as outside the system. So they do something to the natural resource region as a policy and they think it will fix it. But they don't realize that there is a feedback from the change that that's caused to the behavior of people. And so people then do other things and it feeds back to cause different changes. So the feedbacks between the social and ecological domains and the feedbacks across scales are the ones that need primary attention when you're trying to understand and classify your system as a system of feedbacks. Thank you.